All right, greetings, everyone. Uh, this is going to be a lecture on physicalist accounts of mind. And um, I started going through my notes a few minutes ago, and um, I started making corrections and then rearranging slides and getting myself a little confused. And I went, you know, if you keep doing this, you're not going to get the lecture recorded by the end of the day. And I wanted really to do that. So um, this is a cold read of my lecture. I I've given this lecture before, but uh, I've I didn't get through the whole thing. So by the time I get halfway through, I might start stumbling around. And it may not be my usual polished uh, presentation. Um, but let me begin by sharing my screen. Here we are. Okay. So we are continuing on with philosophy of mind. This lecture is meant to come on the heels of the lecture where we looked at Rene Descartes and mind body dualism. Um, we, um, we rehearsed some of the reasons Descartes offered in favor of mind-body dualism. We also rehearsed some of the problems with mind-body dualism. And one of the principal problems is making sense of interactionism. Um, a second problem that's probably no less troubling is the fact that mind-body dualism seems to propose um, that uh, the mind is something which is um, mysterious to the physical sciences, and it can't be studied by the physical sciences because it itself is not a physical entity. Well, that that uh, for those who think that physics really um, and the physical sciences are the rational way of investigating all of reality, the notion that anything, including the mind, exists outside that domain is problematic. Now. I don't accept that view uh, that the physical sciences exhausts the, the, the field of reality. Uh, we looked at that when we looked at our lecture and our critique of scientism. But nevertheless, there are lots of people who are of that uh, mindset. And so they want to resist non-physical accounts of mind. And they think the solution is to offer physical accounts of mind. Well, that's one solution, but we'll get to that. So that's where we're going today. So again, dualist accounts of mind, which relegate the mind to an immaterial, supernatural, non-empirical entity, became increasingly unpopular among psychologists, psychiatrists, and philosophers of mind, as it seemed inconsistent with a scientific understanding of reality and of human nature. Um, what was sought then, uh, from the 19th century onward, uh, were physicalist accounts of mind that did away with dualism by doing away with non-physical accounts of mind. So that's what we're looking at, right? We're gonna do away with the non-physical um, Cartesian type accounts of mind. In this presentation, we're gonna look at six of the most prominent physicalist accounts of mind or physicalist responses to Cartesian dualism. Radical behavioralism, that's one kind of behavioralism, but then a second, we're gonna look at logical behavioralism. Uh, identity theory, illuminative materialism, functionalism, and connectionism. So we'll begin with radical behavioralism. Now, radical behavioralism is introduced in the mid, well, probably the late 1800s by John Watson. And he began what was called behavioralism. Perhaps the best known behavioralist is B.F. Skinner. Um, and uh, you might be familiar with Skinner and his uh, beyond um, uh, Beyond Freedom and Dignity, and uh, his idea, I think he also wrote Walden too, wasn't that another big thing of, of Skinner, and is very big in um, psychological um, uh, camps. I actually was under the mistaken impression that um, there were very few Skinnerians around anymore, but I actually ran into a couple of colleagues of mine from our psychology department who self-identified as strict Skinnerians. I didn't say, oh, I didn't think any of you people were left. But uh, in any event, uh, so B.F. Skinner is probably the best known behaviorist. But here's the thing, radical behavioralism probably is not, um, should not be seen as a metaphysical view about the nature of mind. Rather, it's a prescription for the science of mind. And it says, look, if we're going to do the science of mind, then we must not uh, consider any events except those that can be publicly witnessed. So the idea is if we're going to be serious about um, uh, science and being scientists and the science of psychology, then we have to restrict ourselves to what is public and what can be witnessed publicly. 
Again, this logically excludes non-physical mental events, even if such exist. So that's just not what they're interested in talking about because it's not what can be publicly witnessed. Now, strictly speaking, this uh, restriction on what a science of mind consists in does not excel itself um, disprove the existence of an immaterial mind, but that's not what they were seeking to do. They were seeking to study the mind and restrict themselves to explanations about the mind, which were purely empirical uh, and, uh, and witness it, right? So you can see behavior, you can time behavior, you can measure behavior, you can quantify behavior. And so they're gonna restrict themselves to talk of behavior. So that's uh, what radical behavioralism is. Behaviorism is a theory about behavior and its causes. And the suggestion among behaviorists then is that all human behavior can be explained by prior conditioning. So because of prior conditioning, we are trained in a sense to behave by uh, and, uh, in certain ways. We are trained to not behave in other ways. And this is by positive and negative reinforcements of certain behaviors so that those which are negatively reinforced, you stop engaging in. And those that are positively reinforced you continue to engage in, right? So of course, famously, we have a Pavlov's dog where they would ring a bell slightly shortly before they would feed the dog. And then it got to be where at the sound of the bell itself, the dog would begin to salivate. And the idea is the prior conditioning is what's causing the current behavior. The current salivating behavior is caused by the bell and the prior conditioning. As a scientific method, um, radical behavioralism need not deny the existence of immaterial mental events. However, Watson himself suggested that belief in consciousness goes back to ancient days of superstition and magic. So he doesn't really take these accounts of human behavior as serious science or as really veridical. Um, he concludes that our concept of consciousness, this is Watson now, is not merely complicated and confused, but rather that there really could not be any such thing. So on his view, there is um, no reason to suggest there is the non-mental and every reason to suggest that there isn't. But again, he wasn't trying to prove the, non the, the non-existence of immaterial mental events. He just thought they, they played no role in explanation, explaining human behavior. Again, quoting Watson, he says, no one has ever touched a soul or seen one in a test tube or has in any other way come into relationship with it as he has with other objects of his daily experience. So notice this is that sort of hard boiled scientific mentality coming through that saying, look, let's restrict ourselves to the things that we know exists through our sensory uh, apparatus, right? Now that's radical behavioralism. Again, it was a prescription for how the science of human psychology should be conducted. Logical behavioralism is a different view. And logical behavioralism is um, credited with a philosopher of the name of Gilbert Ryle. Um, and he's, he puts this out in a book of his called, oh no, I think it was, it was in an article called The Dogma of the Ghost in the Machine. The book was called The Concept of Mind. You don't have to worry about any of that. But Ryle was actually following another philosopher, uh, a near contemporary Ludwig Wittgenstein. And both Ryle and Wittgenstein are emphasizing um, a careful analysis of language because they think that a lot of supposed philosophical problems are really the result of misusing language or misunderstanding what's going on uh, and being misled by language. And so if we were more careful in how we deploy language and we understand language and we interpret language, some of the supposed problems of philosophy are evaporate uh, or they become disentangled, right? In fact, Ryle thought that uh, the, um, the goal of philosophy is to show the fly the way out of the bottle, right? What does he mean by that metaphor? Well, the fly is not really trapped in the, bo in the bottle. There is a way out, but it's sometimes tricky to see. And so the, the, um, the role of philosophy is to act as the guide to those who are perhaps befuddled because it's difficult to see the way out. So in his first chapter, Descartes' Myth, 
Ryle describes what he calls the official doctrine, right? And so he's cataloging or going through some of the same things we discussed in the previous uh, presentation about the, the um, mind-body dualism and what is part of this, quote, official doctrine. That bodies are in space and are subject to mechanical laws which govern all other bodies in space and can be expected, inspected by external observers, while minds, in contrast, are not in space and are subject to no mechanical laws. Uh, also, part of that dogma is that one has direct and unchallengeable cognizance of at least some of the episodes of one's own private history. In other words, our mental events are private, um, but not our bodily events, right? Our body events are not private, they're public, and I don't have um, uh, incorrigible access to my history of my body. One can directly and authentically be apprised of the present states and operations of one's mind through introspection. So all I need to do is turn my mental gaze inward to determine whether I'm hungry or whether I'm cold or whether I have a headache or whether I smell a rose or something like that. Again, mental events are supposedly known through introspection and are incorrigible, whereas bodily events cannot be known through introspection. I need to pay a doctor to run a scan to determine whether I have a, a tumor or not. I can't introspect that. And they're corrigible. I might think that I uh, don't have a heart uh, condition, but in fact, I do have a heart condition or, or some such. Also, a, per a person's present thinking, uh, feelings and willings and his perceivings, rememberings and imaginations are intrinsically phosphorescent. So they have this, this subjective feel, right? I, there's something um, unique to subjective experience, uh, which uh, is not captured by objective accounts of reality. The problem occurs for the official position of how a person's mind and body influence one another. So Ryle's pointing to the problem of interaction. Transactions between the private history, the internal mental history, and the public history, the external somatic history, remains mysterious by definition. Such tri uh, transactions belong to neither series. So again, this is a point I made in the previous um, presentation as well, that um, whatever the transactions are between the mind and the body, they're not, they can't be spatial transactions since they involve the mind and the mind isn't spatial, but they can't be non-spatial transactions because they involve the body and the body is spatial. So they belong to neither series. Doesn't that make things mysterious and just weird? What has physical existence is in space and time and is composed of matter or else is the function of matter. But what has mental existence is in time, but not space and consists of consciousness or else the functions of consciousness. Again, he's laying out what he takes to be the official doctrine, but again, he thinks this is a total mistake. Ryle argues that this official doctrine is absurd and is a category mistake. Quoting from Ryle, he says, it's not merely an assemblage of particular mistakes, it's one big mistake and a mistake of a special kind. It is namely a category mistake. Now in this course, we discussed category mistakes once before. He means it in a slightly different way. It's related, but it's slightly different, but we're gonna look at what he means when he's using the term category mistake. Again, Ryle argues that these uh, conjectures of the difference between mind and body, et cetera, are absurd, but they are absurd because, uh, uh, but they come to us, they, these absurd conjectures come to us because we're making this category mistake. Notice he's not denying that there are mental properties. What he's saying is that the phrase, there occur mental processes, and um, rather does not mean the same sort of thing as the phrase, there occurs physical processes. And it makes no sense to conjoin or disjoin the two. So when I say there are mental processes, Ryle thinks I'm saying something true, but I don't mean the same thing as when I say there are physical properties right, or processes. Um, and that you can't talk about mental processes and physical processes in the same context. Uh, and to do so is to make a mistake. 
we must reconceive what is meant by mental talk. So again, he's emphasizing solving the problem, the mind-body problem, by doing a careful, more nuanced understanding of what's going on with mental language and mental talk. He gives an example. A foreigner visiting Oxford or Cambridge for the first time is shown a number of colleges, libraries, playing fields, museums, scientific departments, and administrative offices. He asks then, but where is the university? I have seen where the members of the colleges live, where the registrar works, where the scientists experiment and the rest, but I have not yet seen the university in which reside all the work and members of your university. But you see why that's a mistake, right? Does the university exist? Yes. Do the colleges and the registrar's office and the uh, scientific labs exist? Yes. But do you say both the university exists and those other items exist? No, those other items are the university. And to put them in the same context as if they were coexisting things is to make a mistake. Then it has to be explained to him that the university is none other, uh, not, not another collateral institution, some ulterior counterpart to the colleges, laboratories, and offices, which he has seen. The university is just the way in which all these that he has already seen is organized. Right? So what is the university? Well, it is the joint organization and interdependency and functioning of the elemental parts of the university. That's what the university is. Again, is it correct to say the university exists? Yes. Is it correct to say that the colleges, laboratories, and offices exist? Yes. Is it to say that the university exists and the colleges, laboratories, and offices exist in the same sense? No. Again, quoting from Ryle, he says, he was mistakenly allocating to the university the same category as that to which the other institutions belong. Similarly, one may say that he bought a left glove and a right glove, but not that he bought a left glove, a right glove, and a pair of gloves. You see where that would be a mistake. If I said, yes, I bought a right glove and a left glove. I also bought a pair of gloves. But that's what you mean by the right glove and the left glove. The pair is nothing other than the two understood or conjoined in a certain way. Ryle suggests that it is equally absurd to say there exists a body and there exists a mind, and to suppose that these two exist in the same way and stand in some sort of relationship to one another. The pair of gloves is not an entity in addition to the right glove and the left glove, the pair is the two gloves considered in a particular way, something that this conceptual confusion accounts for the apparent mind-body problem, according to Ryle. So does the mind exist? Yes, but the mind is simply the body and the body's functioning considered in a particular way. It's not something over and above the body that it stands in relation to the body. So, now, what is his positive account of mind? So far, we realize he's rejecting the official account. We realize he thinks there's something uh, screwy going on with the language. What is his account of mental language? Well, his analysis of mental language depends on the notion of a disposition. Certain things are said to be disposed to behave in certain ways. So a disposition is the tendency for something to behave in a predictable way, given certain conditions. So if I say that um, water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, what I'm saying is water is such that at 32 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, it will freeze. It's disposed to freeze. It's disposed to boil at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So again, when we know certain things about water, we come to understand that it behaves in certain ways, characteristic ways, under certain conditions. It has certain dispositions to behave. That's what a disposition is. So dispositions are uh, captured by if-then conditionals. So when I say water is soluble, well, I'm sorry, salt is water soluble. What does that mean? That means if you put salt in unsaturated water, it will dissolve. 
That's what you mean to say that salt is water soluble or that a poison might be alcohol soluble, et cetera, okay? Uh, but it's such as to dissolve in alcohol, not water, right? To say that glass is fragile is to say that it is such that it will break if struck with a hammer, right? So that's what I mean to say. So when I ascribe fragility to the glass, all I'm saying is it is such as to behave uh, in certain predictable ways under certain conditions. It has a disposition to shatter when struck by a hammer, right? But notice, it's actually shorthand for a rather long, perhaps infinitely long set of conditionals. Because yes, it is such as to break if struck by a hammer or if struck by a brick or if struck by a crowbar or, 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 right? So when I say that that glass is fragile, I'm really doing a very brief shorthand for what otherwise would be a very long set of conditionals. Uh, complex conditionals. So telling you that the glass is fragile is giving you useful information and saving you a lot of time, but it's really only telling you that the glass is disposed to break, and again is a shorthand for a series of if-then statements. And this can be a kind of explanation, right? If I asked why did the glass break, you might say, oh, because it was struck by a rock. Right? So question, why is the glass broken? Answer, because it was struck by a rock. But if I challenge this explanation by pointing out that the brick wall was also hit by the rock, but it didn't shatter, the person doing the explaining might respond and add to the explanation saying, oh, well, that's because the glass is fragile, but the brick wall is not. So why is it that Throwing a rock at a glass is likely to break it, but throwing a rock at a brick wall is not likely to break it. Well, you might want to talk about a disposition. The glass has a disposition to shatter, the brick wall does not. Now, admittedly, this dispositional explanation is ultimately shallow. To say the glass broke under the spe specified conditions because it was fragile, amounts to saying that the glass broke under the specialized conditions because it was such as to break under specialized conditions. Again, if I said, why did the water, uh, water soluble salt dissolve in the water? You might say, because it was such as to dissolve in the water or because it has a pre-existing disposition to dissolve in the water. Well, that's true, but it's kind of shallow, right? Eventually, I want to know why is the glass fragile? In other words, why is the glass such as to break when struck with a rock? And by contrast, why is the brick wall not such as to break when struck as the, by the, uh, by the uh, rock? Uh, why is salt such as to dissolve in unsaturated water? Right? And that may require we go into a much deeper explanation where I talk about molecules and molecular structures, et cetera. Nevertheless, that doesn't change the fact that it is useful to know that something is fragile, which of course is why they mark it on postal packages, et cetera, you know, fragile, right? Um, it's useful information. And I can know that something is fragile without knowing why something is fragile. So Ryle is distinguishing two different sets of explanations, right? Why did the glass break? That's the question. Well, that can be explained in the causal sense, and I can give the event which stood to fracture the glass as cause to effect. So in other words, why did the glass break? Because it was struck by a rock, right? So that's the causal sense. Or I could give the dispositional sense, which is that law-like relation between antecedent um, conditions that are general hypothetical proposition if captures, um, and the second happening, the consequent, right? Uh, and I can say, well, because it was fragile, and again, fragile is shorthand for because it was such that if it was struck by a rock, it would break. So there's the causal sense of an explanation, which is a little deeper, and the dispositional sense of a uh, an explanation, which is a little shallow, but under the right conditions might be valuable. 
So logical behavioralism differs from radical behavioralism. Remember, I started by telling you that. Why? Well, because logical behavioralism is not a psychological theory about the causes of human behavior, but rather it's a theory about the meaning of mentalistic terms. So logical behavioralism, and let the word help you remember, logical as in logos, as in word analysis, right? So logical behavioralism is trying to analyze mental language, mental words, and say, oh, well, here's what a mental term really is. Saying, look, applying a mental term, according to logical behavioralism, is attributing a mental property to a person is logically equivalent to saying that the person has a disposition to behave in certain ways. So when I apply a mental term to someone saying he knows where he lives, or uh, she believes that um, uh, uh, the, this, I don't know, uh, uh, why can't I think of a single belief? She believes that the, the uh, Coke is poison, right? To say she believes the Coke is poison or he knows where he lives is not to talk about some interior uh, subjective feel or some introspected bit of knowledge, uh, something that psychologists can't get at or something like that. No, when I say he knows where he lives, I mean, he is such as to find his way home at the end of the day. He has a disposition to navigate his way home. I know my car is in the parking lot means I am such as to go to the parking lot at the end of the day when I want to drive home. To say that she believes the Coke is poison means uh, she avoids uh, drinking the Coke. She isn't going to drink it, well, unless she wants to commit suicide. That's another story. Okay? So attributing mental qualities like beliefs or wishes or hopes or desires or fears is merely to attribute dispositions to behave. And I'm not talking about any mysterious thing that um, we can't get to. I'm talking about what is publicly observable, exactly the sort of thing the radical behavioralists wanted to talk about. Well, that's all mental terms amount to, according to logical behavioralism. They only amount to these dispositions to behave. Applied to mental states then, to say that a person knows something or aspires to be something, is not to say that he is at a particular moment in the process of doing or undergoing anything, but that he is able to do certain things when the need arises, or that he is prone to do or feel certain things in certain situations of certain sorts. So again, it's to talk about behavior, latent behavior, dispositions to behave. To say she is thirsty, is merely to assert an if-then relationship. If you put a glass of water in front of her, she will drink it. So when I say she is thirsty, I'm not talking about some private sensation I can't get to, some secret internal mental mysterium that uh, Descartes might talk about. No, when I say she's thirsty, that sentence merely is shorthand for, if you put a glass of water in front of her, she will drink it. Of course, it's more complicated than that. And if you put a glass of Coke in front of her, she will drink it. And if you put a glass of Muturva in front of her, she will drink it. And you get the idea. To say she is thirsty is not to assert that there is some private mental state occurring we might uh, call a sensation of thirst. That simply is not what mental talk means or how it works according to logical behavioralism and Gilbert Ryle. Likewise, to say I love my wife is really to talk about my behavior. I am such as to engage in love behavior towards my wife. That's all you're saying, right? That is, if she is sick, I will get her medicine. If she is hungry, I will prepare dinner for her. If it is her birthday, I will give her a gift. If blah, blah, blah. So I love my wife is shorthand for what would be a really, really, really complicated and expansive set of um, if-then conditionals, perhaps innumerably many more. So this mental talk saves us a lot of time. Right? What are the advantages of logical behavioralism? Well, it eliminates all the mysterious mental things, right? 
then the problem of dualism does not arise because he's not trying to talk about how an immaterial mind interacts with a material body or vice versa. Causal interactions between mind and body is consistent with the causal connections between a physical state, which accounts for the disposition to behave in certain ways, and the actual consequent behavior. So I'm saying my body is in, say I'm thirsty, that means my body is in a physical state. We could get some physiologists to help us figure that out, but I, such that if you put a glass of water in front of me, I will drink it. And then my behavior is explained by the fact that I'm in that state and then the event happens. You put a glass of water on in front of me and sure enough, there I am drinking it. Problems. Well, frankly, I always thought logical behavioralism is deeply problematic, right? Uh, it seems utterly absurd to think behavioristically when talking to a friend or listening to someone talk to us. If a friend tells you she is depressed, this does not mean the same thing as she is such as to cry and she is such as not to eat and she is such as to not to go to work and she is such as not to enjoy television programs. And that's not what it means, right? Now, those behaviors may coincide with her being depressed. But what she's telling me, I think, is how she feels, this interior sensation, not her describing dispositions to behave in certain ways. If I say, do you want to go to the movie? She was disposed to say no, right? That's not what being depressed is. And certainly not what she's talking about or describing when she's describing that to me. So I just don't think it's an adequate account of mine. Behavioralism becomes pure nonsense in the cases of one's own mental life and trying to understand talk about my own mental states. Again, my pain is not the same thing as my disposition to behave. It is not what I mean when I report I am in pain. Again, when I say I have a headache, I am not saying the same thing as I am such as to take an aspirin, or I am such as to take a Tylenol, or I am such as to take an Advil. I may be such as to behave in those ways. I'm more likely to think I'm such as to behave in those ways and what's causing me to behave in those ways is my pain, which is different than the disposition. Right? So the pain accounts for why I have the disposition. It's not the same thing as the disposition. Be that as it may, it seems a problematic account, both when uh, trying to come up with uh, subjective accounts of mental life by others, but certainly even what I mean when I'm describing my own subjective mental states. But another problem for behavioralism is that mental states affect other mental states and behavioralism can't seem to account for that. Notice she might be thirsty, but here's something that behaviorists couldn't account for. She's thirsty. And sometimes I put a glass of water in front of her and she drinks it. And sometimes I put a glass of water in front of her and she doesn't drink it. So why is it that if she is thirsty, such as to drink a glass of water, if put in front of her, sometimes the um, the stimulus, putting the last water in front of her, has the predicted uh, effect, she drinks it, and sometimes the very same stimulus has a different effect, she doesn't drink it. This was something that the logical behaviorists had a difficult time accounting for. Actually, for that matter, it's something the radical behaviorists had a little bit of a difficult time accounting for as well. But it would seem clear from the linguistic end, that's the logical end, right? She is thirsty, the sentence not only equates to an infinitely long chain of if-then statements, if I put a glass of water, if I put a glass of Coke, if I put a glass of Minerva, if I put a glass of orange juice, if I put a blah, blah, blah. It actually is more complicated than that. So that would be bad enough. It was infinitely long chain of conditionals, but it's more complicated than that. And why is that, right? Well, if she is thirsty and I put a glass of Coke in front of her, she will drink it. But behaviorally, she will drink the Coke if I put it in front of her, if she does not believe it to be poison, and if she does not believe it to be Diet Coke, because she doesn't like Diet Coke, and if she's not trying to cut back on sugary drinks, because maybe she'll avoid it if she's cutting back on sugary drinks, even if she's thirsty, and if she notices the Coke, so I put it in front of her and she doesn't happen to notice it, she isn't necessarily going to drink it, or if she genuinely believes that it's Coke, and, and not something else, you know, just some fizzy brown liquid or maybe 
birch beer that she doesn't care for or something like that, right? But notice my explanation of if I put a glass in front of her, she is thirsty, equates to if I put a glass in front of her of Coke in front of her, she will drink it, but then it has to be conditioned. And notice how it's conditioned. I'm referencing other beliefs or intentions uh, or uh, awarenesses, mental, mental, mental. So the whole point of the if-then conditional was to get rid of, to exercise all of the mental terms but I seem to rely on mental terms to cash out the conditional, the if then conditional in the first place. So I'm, I'm, I had to go fall back on mental terms in order to cash out the mental terms. I'm not really that much further ahead. So note the if then language, which was trying to translate the mental into behavior actually must include more mental talk, beliefs, wants, notices, et cetera. So quickly rehearsing the problems we've just gone over, logical behavioralism seems inadequate to account for the, uh, the subjective um, uh, language or the sub subjective descriptions offered by uh, individuals of their mental lives. It seems totally inadequate as a way of accounting for your own subjective experiences and uh, mental states affect other mental states and behavioralism gives us no easy way of accounting for that. As one of Watson's early critics commented, quote, what behaviorism shows is that some psychologists do not always think very well, not that they don't think at all. It's a joke. All right, third is identity theory. So this is a view associated with an Australian philosopher, uh, JJ Smart. Um, the mind body or more accurately mental events and certain body events are identical. Right, so that's what the identity theory is about, right? So notice right off the bat, it is saying there are mental events, it is saying there are physical events, but what it's saying is these are not two sets of events that influence one another, they're really the very same thing. So in a sense, this was anticipated by Spinoza and Russell, if you recall from the uh, previous presentation, and Russell's dual aspect theory. But unlike others, uh, it tries to tie itself as closely as possible to current scientific research. And although it's not a scientific theory itself, it removes any mysterious something such that uh, it, as found in Spinoza and Russell. So Spinoza talks about substance, Russell talks about, well, he doesn't, he tries to avoid the whole subject of what, ha what things have these dual aspects. Well, what this view is saying, no, no, let me be very specific, brain events have these dual aspects. Brain events have mental aspects and physical aspects because brain events really are the same thing as mental events. Maybe brain and central nervous system, we may expand that. The identity theory says that there are mental events, but they are identical to the same thing as certain physical events, that is processes in the brain. Mentalistic terms, such as wants, believes, loves, etc., do refer to something. Insist that mentalistic terms refer not only to a mental state, but that this mental state is nothing other than a neurological process that scientists someday will be able to specify. So my memory of my grandmother's kitchen is some process in my brain. My love for my wife is some process or some set of processes in my brain. My memory, oh, I said memory already. My knowledge of um, the constitution is some set of processes in my brain. All of this accounts for brain and brain processes. So again, there are mental events. There are things like pains, desires, wishes, hopes, memories, wants, etc. But the, all those things ultimately are brain processes. Right? Again, the advantages of this view, as was hoped for, the dualism is avoided. We need not talk about mysterious, non-spatial, um, immaterial mental stuff. <coughs> mysterious interaction is avoided. There exists only physical phenomena. And I have a headache, should have appeared, um, equals such and such is going on in my brain. Now there remains a dualism of language, but not a dualism of entities, 
right, events or properties. So notice um, I can refer to my brain events directly. Uh, this, uh, I don't know, neuron is firing, right? Or I can refer to it mentally. Uh, I smell a chocolate. But those really are the same thing. The neuron firing is the smelling of chocolate. The smelling of chocolate really is neuron firing. So I'm referring to the same thing, uh, but I'm using two different kinds of language. So you have a dualism of language, but not a dualism of entities. Like nations, we can all agree that nations are real, exist, and have unique properties their, uh, their own, while also agreeing that nations uh, are reducible ultimately to physical objects and physical forces. Unlike nations, the nations example, however, the two languages are so very different that there may still be good reason to suppose that the thing they refer to are not in fact the very same things at all that should be plural, the things they refer to. Right? So again, what the identity theory is insisting is that my memory of my grandmother's kitchen is what's going on in my brain, that they are the same thing. Yeah, but the memory of my grandmother's kitchen is blue. The thing in my brain isn't blue. Right? Um, how can they be the same thing? Notice this is shades of Descartes and shades of the problem of the indiscernibility of identicals. You might go, oh, well, that's only because you're using two different kinds of language to refer to the same thing. But why should the same thing be describable in such um, radically different ways and almost incompatible ways? Um, again, if I say, um, you know, that um, my, my perception of that uh, cheese is stinky, right? The odor of that cheese is I'm having a, a stinky cheese sensation. That sensation has a stinky smell. Nothing in my brain has that stinky smell. Right? So they can't, it doesn't see how they could be the same thing. Further, a person aware of a red after image is aware of something with a unique color, shape, etc. But the something is not a brain event, nor a physical event of any kind. No brain event has a color or shape of that kind. So um, students may not be as familiar with after images as people of a certain generation, right? Uh, I lived in the day where we had cameras that had flash bulbs. And very often when you were taking a photograph, you had to use a flash bulb, which would do a big flash when it would take the photo to illuminate uh, what you were photographing. And if you stared at the flash, you may see red after images, those floating images. But you can still see, you might already, even if you're not familiar with flash bulbs, be familiar with red uh, after images or those sort of um, optical illusions. Maybe you get hit on the head or something like that, or you're staring at a bright light and then you look away and you see these things sort of floating around. Well, you are looking at something. You are aware of something. Those things have a shape, have a color. Um, but there is no event in your brain that has that same shape and that same color. So that doesn't seem to be any event in your brain that is identical to the thing you're referring to. Research can and has shown that certain thoughts are correlated to certain brain processes, yes, but correlation is not yet identity. And again, this is a point that um, Phaser makes in his criticism of scientism. The most you're ever going to get from identity theory is correlation. It itself cannot prove identity, right? Why? Because of the dualism of language. Because the uh, physical sciences are restricted to, to talking about the quantitative, the subjective experiences are use language which is qualitative. And all you're gonna show is this bit of quantitative description coordinates with this bit of qualitative description, but that is not enough to show that they're referring to the same thing. Again, this was uh, Phaser's point. This is one of the problems I'm raising here as well. My experience of the rose smells sweet and rosy, but no brain event of mine smells rosy. Presumably, all my brain events smell the same. Brainy, right? <laughs> Whatever a brain smells like, and I don't want to know what a brain smells like. Thank you very much. Right? 
Further complications for the identity theory. What kind of identity are we suggesting here? A type type identity or a token token identity? Now it occurs to me, I probably should have slipped another slide in here where I make the distinction between what's the difference between a type and a token. Um, uh, and it's easy to understand, it's just, I don't have it. So I'm gonna make up for that by telling you. If I had say three nickels in my pocket, I would have three tokens of a single type. What do I mean? I have three nickels, each is an individual token, but it's an exemplification of a single type, right? Nickel type. Um, if I had a, um, a nickel, uh, if I had three nickels in my pocket and one penny in my pocket, I would have four coins, four tokens, but uh, three tokens of one type and one token of one type, right? In other words, three nickel tokens and one penny token. Two different types, the nickel type and the penny type, but different tokens, right? Hopefully that makes sense, right? So now the question is, is it the case that every time a certain kind of event, a certain type of event happens in my brain, this coordinates with a particular type of mental, um, mental event, right? It's identical to a mental event, right? So every brain event number four, uh, 347, I'm making it up, uh, is, is the same thing as uh, a love experience. So uh, every time I experience love, brain event 347 is happening. Every time brain event 347 is happening, love experience is happening because they really are the same thing. That would be a token, token, I'm sorry. That would be a type, type identity. This type of mental experience is the same as this type of brain experience. But this becomes immediately problematic, right? Because number one, dolphins, let's say, they don't have human brains. So they don't have any mental events that are identical or even similar to um, a human brain events, right? Because they don't have human brains or my dog or, or androids that are mechanical intelligences or something like that. They don't have brains at all, right? So they never have brain event a 347. So they never have love experience. Why? Because they don't have brain event 347 because they don't have human brains. So that would be kind of problematic. It's even problematic if we strict ourselves to humans. Maybe not every human brain can support brain event 347. If there's various differences in how the brain develops and, 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 and uh, has grown or whatnot. And even my brain event uh, 347 may not equate to the same love experience if different things go on in my brain, right? So I think a type type identity is going to be very difficult to establish and maybe impossible. I notice love is such a broad term. I love my wife. I love chocolate ice cream. Um, um, I love um, uh, jazz music, but those are all very different kinds of love. So there may not be any one brain event that equates to each and every one of those instances of love. And that's because our mental talk maybe is too sloppy and our brain talk is much more precise. Any event, there's all kinds of problems trying to work out a type type identity. But let's say it's a token token identity. So, well, okay, all I'm saying is every love experience is equivalent to some brain event. I don't know which one. I uh, don't always, it's not always the same. Uh, it's not uh, clear across brains or across species or in a, even in intelligent life forms uh, that are, uh, you know, mechanical or something like that. Well, that's not very helpful then, is it? Right? All you're saying is, well, if you're having a mental event, there's some brain event that that's equivalent to. All right, but that's not much of a, and I can't tell you which one, and I can't tell you it'll be the same that next time that brain event happens. Number four. Number four proposes eliminating mental talk, and that's why it's called eliminative materialism. It proposes that our increasing knowledge of the workings of the brain will make outmoded our, quote, folk psychology, close quote, um, talk about the mind, and we will learn to talk the language of neuro neurology instead. 
So I alluded to this in the previous presentation. These folks are saying, look, um, the identity folks are in for a rough, uh, a rough time if they're trying to do a, uh, a um, type type identity because mental language is so broad and vague and confused. And a token token identity isn't very useful anyway. Maybe the better thing to do is simply jettison mental talk in general. And what they, uh, in a pejorative way, refer to as folk psychology. So they're, they're being deliberately pejorative when they name mental descriptions that way. When proponents of eliminative materialism use the phrase folk, psych um, folk psychology, they use it as a pejorative. They're referring to the ordinary way we human uh, beings explain human behavior in terms of desires, wishes, fears, hopes, etc. Or I might say, um, she went to the store because she wanted chocolate ice cream, or uh, he avoided the pool because he's afraid of drowning, or uh, she's taking general bio one and two because she hopes to go to medical school. So notice we use um, mental talk to describe human behavior and explain human behavior all the time. Well, what they're saying is, oh, that, that would do back in the old days, right? In the olden times. Um, but that's just not a very modern or very scientific way of understanding human actions or explaining human behaviors. And eventually, we're going to stop that. Eventually, we are going to replace those folk explanations with genuine scientific explanations grounded in neurology, neurobiology, brain science. Um, oh, so what they want to discard is the third bullet. They want to discard the idea that we should use mental terms to explain why people act the way they do, and again, not do that anymore, and rather embrace uh, the talk of neurobiology. Eliminative materialism suggests that these are bad pseudo explanations. Folk psychology, they claim, is unreliable at best. It is useless in explaining why human beings do things like sleep. In other words, it wasn't until we had a better understanding of the brain that we could understand why human beings do sleep, sometimes why they can't sleep, what is going on when sleep happens, right? So we needed brain science to do that. Folk explanations give us no insight into all kinds of um, mental processes. It is equally useless at explaining why human beings have certain mental disabilities or mental disorders. So brain science seems far more uh, useful and productive in explaining why people are engaged in certain kinds of behavior, maybe obsessive compulsive behavior, maybe um, uh, having autism spectrum symptoms, uh, maybe clinical depression. This is better explained by brain science than by these folk explanations. These, uh, they do insist that folk psychology is an old fashioned way of trying to explain things before we had genuine scientific understanding of the world in the same way that belief in witchcraft and animism were old fashioned unscientific ways of trying to explain the world prior to the age of modern science. These old fashioned pre-scientific folk pseudo explanations await a mature science to replace them. So in other words, you're never going, uh, a mature science doesn't try to explain what witchcraft really is. A mature science explains why we shouldn't have been talking about witchcraft in the first place, and we should stop talking about it now. In a similar way, they're going to maintain that a mature science is not going to try to explain what a desire for chocolate ice cream really is. It's going to talk about why we should stop talking, why it was a mistake to talk about desiring chocolate ice cream in the first place, and why we should stop talking about it now. It claims that neuro neurological explanations of human behavior are opposed to mentalistic explanations. So notice it is not the identity theory, quite the opposite, in part because the materialist account of our mental capacities seems unlikely. Right? So they seem to acknowledge that uh, some sort of uh, identity um, uh, coordination is not going to happen. And so maybe that's simply because the two really aren't identical. There seems to be no nice one-to-one -one matchups in the offing between concepts of folk psychology and concepts of theoretical neuroscience. With increasing knowledge of neurology, our ordinary language, they claim, will be replaced. Part of the problem is that different physical systems could, 
uh, instantiate the required functional org uh, organization. In other words, you know, Vulcans, if they existed, uh, might be able to um, exhibit what we uh, would refer to as beliefs or wishes uh, or concerns or interest, right? Mental, 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 mental. And yet they don't have the same brains or dolphins. I think I spelled that wrong though, yeah. Um, same with memory of two different days, on two different days, right? So my memory of my grandmother's kitchen may not be the same brain event today that it was yesterday. Further, the one-to-one -one matchups uh, will not be found because, quote, our common sense psychological framework is false and radically misleading conception of the causes of human behavior and the nature of cognitive activity. So the eliminative materialists say, look, the reason why the identity theory project is never gonna work is because you're not gonna be able to identify an accurate account of human behavior with an inaccurate, um, misconceived account of human behavior. Just like you're never going to get medicine to explain witchcraft. Why? Because medicine is accurate and witchcraft explanation are wrongheaded and always were. An accurate theory of behavior cannot reduce to an inaccurate one. Churchland, oh, I didn't mention, there are two individuals, uh, Paul and Patricia Churchland. They happen to be a married couple, but they're both advocates of eliminative materialism. So Paul and Patricia Churchland predict that the older framework will simply be eliminated rather than reduced by a mature neuroscience. No reduction of mental terms to physical terms, but rather a mature science will eliminate. I'm repeating myself now, so I'll stop. The simplest increase in mutual understanding that the, I'm sorry, the simple increase in mutual understanding that the new framework made possible could contribute substantially towards a more peaceful and humane society. I, know, I just thought that was an interesting little romantic thing that a Paul Churchland throws in at the end. Now, some have objected that we can never eliminate mental talk since nothing could be more obviously true than that we experience love or have jealousy, et cetera, right? So what's more obvious than the fact that the reason I bought the chocolate uh, candy bar is because I wanted to have chocolate and I like chocolate, mental, mental, mental. That seems to be so immediately apparent. We have pains and pleasures and desires and all these things explain in part why we do the things that we do. So we need mental talk to form these explanations. This is the objection, right? Wait, we can't just eliminate all this stuff. We need all this stuff. This, this is helpful, useful ways of talking about human behavior. But proponents of eliminative materialism counter that all observations occur within uh, some system of concepts and that our observation judgments are only as good as the conceptual framework in which they are expressed. So think back to a moment to, um, to the presentation on, um, oh, Thomas Kuhn and structures of scientific revolution where he talks about paradigms, right? Well, the observation statements are always made relative to the paradigm one is using. So if one is using the paradigm of folk psychology, then of course the observations are going to look like they're confirming your paradigm because that's the those are the glasses you happen to be wearing at the time. But if you took off those glasses and you put on the neurological uh, explanation paradigm, then those observations would cease and you'd start having observations consistent with the new paradigm. So again, nothing could have been more obvious than that the sun circles the earth. We saw that every day, but then our conceptual framework changed and we see the sun does not circle the earth and never did. In the middle ages, it was obvious that witches bring plagues to villages using their black magic, right? As well, what could be more obvious? Well, those were the observations they made because those, that was the um, conceptual framework they were bringing to their experiences. That forms the observations. So again, this is an echo of Kuhn here. So what the illuminative materialists are gonna say is the only reason folk psychology explanations seem so obvious to you is because you're still employing that paradigm. Stop employing that paradigm and you'll see our point. In all three cases, the rotation of the sun, witches, and familiar mental states, precisely what is being challenged is the integrity of the background conceptual frameworks in which those observation judgments are expressed. 
to insist on the validity of one's experience traditionally interpreted is therefore to beg the question against the, uh, the illuminative materialist. For in all three cases, the question is whether we should reconceive the nature of some familiar observational domain. So again, the, the question at issue is, do we have good reason to reject folk psychology as an explanatory resource and that paradigm and to adopt a different paradigm as our explanatory resource? However, I have problems and others do as well. It's not just personal with me. Eliminative materialism, I think, exaggerates the defects of folk psychology and it underplays the real successes. So it does say, well, you know, it really does never done anything good whatsoever. Well, that's clearly not the case, right? Think about the social sciences. They all seem to be built on psychological terms, right? Uh, political science, international relations, uh, certain forms of psychology. But for that matter, marketing. When marketing executives are pulling out, um, you know, new marketing campaigns, very often they're employing things like people's consumer desires or consumer fears or consumers' expectations, mental, mental, mental. And they are able to craft effective marketing campaigns and political campaigns and um, uh, international negotiations utilizing the explanatory resources of what has been referred to as folk psychology. So eliminative materialism is kind of underplaying some of the successes of folk psychology as a means of explaining human behavior. Nevertheless, it does underscore that we are not faced with merely two possibilities, a pure reduction of mental talk to physical talk or a pure elimination. Perhaps these are endpoints of a smooth spectrum of possible outcomes. So maybe we can get some reduction and some elimination or some combination of the two. Um, number five, we're almost to the end, there's only six, right? Number five is functionalism. Functionalism is the idea that the mind is kind of like a computer. Um, and since the introduction of computers, scientific criticism of dualism has taken another line. It's no coincidence that this view arrives during the computer age. Could, for example, mental processes be based on a network of electronic signals in a properly designed complex of transistors and circuit boards? In other words, could mental processes be the product of a computer? Functionalism maintains that minds are produced not so much by particular kinds of materials, but rather by relations between parts. Some functionalists claim that it is, in principle, possible to build a human mind out of computer parts. Others claim only that the mind is, in effect, a function of patterns of neurological brain activity. One of those is called um, strong functionalism, the other is called weak functionalism. Oh, I think I say that. A uh, crucial distinction between hardware, the actual computer and its circuits, and software, the program that gives rise to the computer's specific instructions. According to functionalists, <clears throat> the mind is nothing other than an elaborate program of sorts, which is the product of a spectacularly complicated pattern of embodied, embodied in the physical workings of the brain. The behavioral output is a product of stimulus input and internal states of the program. Thus the behavioral outcome output rather of some mental events depends on other mental events. Again, this is something that behavioralism cannot account for. So think of functionalism as almost like a um, behavioralism of uh, uh, 0.2 or 0.0, oh, I don't know, a zooped up behavioralism. But don't call it zooped up behavioralism, call it functionalism, but it kind of is like that. So it's talking about um, behavioral input and behavioral output. And computers talk about behavioral input and behavioral output, et cetera. But what it's saying is, is here's what behavioralism missed. Sometimes I do behavioral input A, and I get behavioral output X. Sometimes I do behavioral input A and I get behavioral output not X. What's going on? Ah, say the functionalist, here's what you didn't account for. What output you get depends not only on the input you provide,
But what is the internal states of the program? What's the internal states of the machine? That's the software, right? That's going to interpret the input and then process it according to its own way into a behavioral output. So sometimes when I put a glass of water in front of a thirsty person, she drinks it. Sometimes I put a glass of water in front of a thirsty person, she doesn't drink it. Why? Because of some internal state. Perhaps she's in an internal state of believing that the glass of water is innocent, or perhaps she's in the internal state of believing that the glass of water is poisonous. Right? So that is why it explains the same behavioral input might result in different behavioral output. Consider, for instance, a Coke machine from my youth. In fact, this even predates my youth a little bit, but if you found a really old Coke machine, you might find this one. This is a Coke machine that accepts dimes and nickels for dispensing Cokes for 10 cents. That's how old, yeah, I'm that old. Right? But they were small Cokes, they were little tiny Coke bottles, right? So there's this Coke machine, it dispenses uh, bottles of Coke, little tiny bottles of Coke for 10 cents. Right? Again, it's an old Coke machine. So we have to imagine uh, that is a functional system that has at least two internal states. We'll call them states A and states B. In state A, if you input a dime, it returns, the machine returns to you a Coke and remains in state A. Right? But in state A, if you input a nickel, the machine moves to state B and does not dispense a Coke. Now, if the machine is in state B and you put in a nickel, it dispenses a Coke and it moves to state A. If it's in state B and you input a dime, the Coke return, uh, the uh, machine dispenses a Coke, uh, dispenses a nickel change and returns to state A. So this is a functional mapping of this Coke machine. Um, and notice we could draw up a flow chart uh, where we talk about uh, input and uh, whether you're in state A or state B and we could flow it out, right? So notice it's approaching a, um, a computer program. Of course, it's ridiculously simple, but I think it does the trick for illustration purposes. Notice something also though, to be a Coke machine, to be a a uh, Coke machine dispensing Cokes for uh, a dime or 10 cents, let's say, at, at 10 cents. I didn't tell you what that Coke machine was made of. Maybe it's made of metal. Maybe it's made of wood. Maybe it's made of cardboard. Uh, maybe it's made of ice. I didn't tell you what it's made of. I didn't have to tell you what it's made of. All I had to do was describe its function, its functional program. And anything that has this function is a Coke dispensing Coke machine. Right? Now, make it far more complicated and you can maybe come up with a map for human cognition. Anything which displays that kind of complex input output is exhibiting human cognition. And I didn't tell you what it had to be made of. Maybe it's made of flesh and blood. Maybe it's made of wood. Maybe it's made of iron. Maybe it's made of computer chips. Maybe it's made of ectoplasm. I don't really know what ectoplasm is or whatnot, but I didn't have to tell you what it is. Maybe it's made of dolphin DNA. Maybe it's made of Vulcan DNA. I don't know. I don't have to know. I have to know, does it have the same behavioral inputs and output patterns that uh, we see in human cognition? So being a mind and exhibiting human cognition is a question of functionality. So it's kind of like behavioralism, right? But it's a more complicated than behavioralism because it's acknowledging that in addition to input, you also have to talk about the internal states of the machine. Oh, so here's my little flow chart. Uh, I have it in the notes. It's not really clear here, so I'm not gonna linger on it. Note that the same input can have two different behavioral outputs depending on what mental state the machine is in. We call it mental state. Therefore, this is more uh, subtle than logical behavioralism could hope to be. Also, we have not needed to specify the material of the functional system. The machine could be wood or metal or plastic, et cetera. 
All that was necessary was to theorize the relations among the behavioral output and the required number of arrangements of internal states. Mental talk is reduced to functional operations on input and behavioral output. There is no reason to restrict these functions to humans or even to animals. We can talk about um, artificial intelligence. Anything is a thinking thing that performs the thinking operations, just like anything is a Coke vending machine that can perform the vending machine functions, right? Run the program. Like logical behavioralism, there is nothing uh, peculiarly subjective about thinking or consciousness. Now, um, there's a couple of problems with that. Uh, I think I get to this later. Maybe I get to it. John Searle is a big uh, opponent of functionalism, and we're going to talk about his. His is the last one we're going to talk about here. He, he, and others. He's not alone on this. But um, one of the problems is that notice um, if I'm trying to figure out the program of Word, right? Microsoft Word. But all I have access to is the very different inputs, the very different outputs, um, and under what conditions this input leads to these outputs, et cetera. And so I create by being careful observations of behavioral inputs and outputs and a long history of, of interaction with the program, I come up with a flow chart and I flow chart it out so that I have a, a, a program that's isomorphic with the word program. Does that show me I've discovered word program? Maybe not. Maybe I've written the program for word perfect and you're running word. Now the programs aren't the same. The behavioral output and input patterns are identical, isomorphic, but the programs aren't the same right? because you can have the same um, uh, computational process but they lead to, and they lead to the same behavioral output, but they're different computational processes, right? So, um, oh, I think I say this again later. So let me follow through with my, my uh, PowerPoint. It's getting late and I realize that. Uh, John Searle, contemporary uh, philosopher of mind, attacks the functionalist understanding of mind, specifically the idea that machines can literally think or that thinking is merely a computational function that any sort of computing machine can can, in theory, perform. A functionalist starts with behavior, either human behavior or computer behavior, and claims that understanding human thinking is just a matter of finding the program for that behavior. Anything running that program, exhibiting that behavior, is conscious and thinking by definition. By contrast, connectionists, and John Searle is a connectionist, complain that the functionalism is a top-down software approach which can never be accurate in its representation of human thinking or mind, since um, it completely ignores the hardware of the brain and the computer or the computer. Human thinking takes on the character it does precisely because it is a biological process of certain kinds of biological entities, for instance, our brains. So for instance, human sentences are uh, of any language fall within a predictable length. Why? Because of the shape of our brain, because of our brain capacities. So it's a hardware um, uh, fact about human brains that affects this mental fact about human language. You're not going to get that from the functionalist, from the mapping thing, that explain, explanation. Right? Um, likewise with other processes in thinking, in terms of language recognition, in terms of music recognition, etc. It's literally the structure of our brain which explains why we perceive in certain ways or, or um, have gestalt processes in certain ways. The connectionists insist that the mechanical and physical interactions that occur in the brain determine the kinds of behavior and the kinds of mental functionings the brain engages in. Connected, uh, connectionists advocate a bottom-up approach to understanding the mind. Understanding the mind requires understanding the brain processes. So you can't just look at the external inputs and outputs like the functionalists suggest. According to the connectionist, you have to start with the brain. Note, functionalists are allegedly metaphysically neutral. Remember, they say, oh, I'm not saying what kind of thing could uh, exhibit brain behavior. Right? 
connectionists are still materialists. They're still talking about uh, brains as being the, or minds and mental activity being the, the results of biological brains, physical brains. Connectionists believe that consciousness in its full color and quality is a result of the complicated connections that really go on in the brain. But they are also critical of any strict neurological reduction. So they don't want to say there is a, a reduction like the identity theorists would say. There is no one-to-one -one correspondence between neurons and thoughts or perceptions. Rather, they claim that the hardware of the brain is an immensely complex mechanism to which the functionalists do not do justice. One last point, and this isn't the theory of mind, it's just the last point. So we're done with our theories of mind. Um, Descartes claimed that he could not be wrong about his seeming to be sitting before the fire, right? Remember, he thought that one of the features of the mind was incorrigibility, and so things mental can be known to us directly, privately, and incorrigibly through introspection. So I might be wrong about whether I am sitting before the fire, but I can't be wrong about it seeming to me that I'm sitting before the fire. But the interesting thing is that um, Sigmund Freud introduces the notion of the unconscious mind. Not every mental, not everything mental is knowable. And therefore, surely not everything in the mind can be described incorrigibly. So with the advent of Freudian psychology, you had the suggestion that there are parts of our mind and parts of mentality which are not accessible through introspection and which cannot be known with incorrigibility. And that perhaps a third person would be in a better position to know than the subject himself or herself. Again, we must infer the unconscious from its effects because we can't introspect it. Thus, we have the same relation to our own unconscious mental events as we have to other mental and physical processes in another person. Again, no direct access. There are ideas, experiences, and intentions in our minds that we do not and sometimes cannot know, much less know with certainty. Of course, Freud is famous for suggesting that um, events from our childhood and our babyhood, which we do not access consciously, actually are affecting our current um, exist. <coughs> they're memories that exist. They are affecting our current behavior, but they're not accessible to us through introspection. And that's why you have to pay you know, a psychoanalyst for 20, 30 years to plumb your unconscious because you can't. Thus, the traditional notion of the privileged and direct access and incorrigibility of the mental is seriously challenged by Freudian psychology. But one might counter, if it isn't knowable incorrigibly, then it can't be mental at all. Could we possibly be wrong about our confidence that right now I am experiencing a cold finger uh, feeling in my hand, for instance? The empiricists assume that one could not be wrong about this, for it was on the basis of such certainties that we were able to construct through inductive reasoning, our theories about the world. So there's a sense in which some of the early empiricists like Locke would have agreed with Descartes about the incorrigibility of certain immediate simple sensations like a cold sensation. But consider an example which comes actually from Bishop Barclay. So he was an empiricist. But Barclay asks us to imagine a mischievous friend who tells you he's going to touch your hand with a very hot spoon and you weren't looking and he touches your hand with a piece of ice. You scream and claim, ah, with seeming certainty that he has given you an uncomfortable sensation of heat. But you're wrong. What you felt was cold. What you seem to feel was heat. But even your seeming, in this case, seems to be mistaken. So here we have uh, another challenge to incorrigibility coming to us from Bishop Barclay. Summary and conclusion. Since Descartes, philosophers have struggled to explain how the mind and body work together to constitute a complete human being. Certainly properties of mind make a connection between the mind and certain properties of the mind make the connection between mind and body extremely problematic. Some suggest that mental events and body events are different aspects of a single uh, other entity, the dual aspect theory. Others claim that they occur in parallel like the sound and visual tracks of a film, parallelism or pre-established harmony. 
still others, that bodily events and uh, cause mental events, but are not, but not the other way around. Mental events don't cause bodily events. That's epiphenomenalism. Or that mental events and body events are identical, the identity theory, or we await a mature neuroscience that will dispense with mental talk altogether, illuminative materialism. Of course, this last summary left out uh, the functionalism, a summary, a quick summary of functionalism and a quick summary of connected, uh, connectionism. So I hope this was a helpful walkthrough. You have my notes. And again, you are encouraged and welcome to contact me if you have questions, either by email or setting up an appointment. And I am going to stop sharing and hope you have a good rest of your day.